I was just saying welcome. We wanted to welcome Lynn and Julie and Jeffrey and Tony. Hello. Hello, W. Tucker Clark and Anita. Hello. And Cassandra and Mary and Kimberly Williams. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are going to go on an adventure into the realm of sacred storytelling. And I invite you to give yourself this hour, like really like, like give it to yourself. And if you can like turn over your phone or turn off the alerts, because I'm going to be going fairly quickly. And there's going to be many opportunities for you to really do some exploration into how the stories of our time are living through you. And there are going to be times that I ask you questions and I'm not asking just to, it's not, you know, empathetical. It's like, it's, I'm really asking to hear your voice or to hear your thoughts in the chat. So <clears throat> please know that that is there. Um, and you're going to have to pardon my voice today. It's, uh, it's having a hard time recovering from a little something. And <clears throat> so it is what it is and we are what we are and here we be. So I invite you to close your eyes. Close your eyes. And I invite you to come into this space of just noticing <clears throat> how are you, how is your body in location? So we're, we're, we're going to start off with a noticing exercise. And in this noticing, just noticing how are you seated? Our body tells everything. And so are you seated so that you're leaning forward? Are you slunched over? Are you like leaning way back? Are you off to the side? Before you do anything, don't change it. At first, just do this real body scan just to notice and to really notice what it feels like in that position. And perhaps you're sitting in this like wonderfully aligned and balanced position and you're like, wow, that feels good. I worked. I worked to come into that kind of alignment. My core muscles are strong. My back is straight, you know, and it feels good to be held in the world this way. I feel supported from behind and met in the front and all the things. And that that might be amazing. If you're a little bit like me, I just found myself leaning forward. And I was like, you know what? How about this balance? And so I invite you to come and come into this place of balance where you really are resting on your sit bones. And as if you could breathe in from the bottom of your feet, breathing in from the bottom of your feet, really feeling what it is to be connected to the floor. I'm going to use the word floor right now, but I'm actually going to ask you to connect to something else, to the origin life that your floor is built from. So mine is wood. Yours might be linoleum. It might be rug. It might be something that there was a core element that was once alive and living on this earth that in its transformation and transmutation, it is now in a state and form where it's supporting you in this moment. And so I'm going to invite you to connect to that original source of life. And breathe that into your body. So if you could breathe in from the bottom of your feet, your connection to this earth in all of its forms. I place of connection, I'm going to invite you to place your hand on your heart and on your belly, connecting to that core wisdom that is yours, that lives inside your gut, that, that place that we know that has a second brain inside of it. There's so much intelligence there, connecting to your heart and really coming to this place of understanding what, what brought you to this, this doorway of this, of this realm of sacred storytelling. What calls you here? What inside of you is asking to speak out, to be heard, to be witnessed? What inside of you is asking to be revealed, to be expressed? Are there stories inside you that are just like, it's just time for you to tell them because you've got wisdom to share? Are there stories inside of you that are locked up into these 
kind of hard forms of stuck energy and are causing a form of depression in your system because a life force can't move through because there's something that's asking to be alchemized, healed, revealed, transformed. Is the muse knocking at your door, pleading for you to open your channel because the new stories of our time are ready to come through you. You've been chosen. When I say that, it's not like we're special if we've been chosen. It's just that we're alive to understanding the power of our vessels. We know how to work with them. This muse energy, this life force energy, I really believe it will come to anyone who's willing to open to play to it. Are you one of those people that's called to be a cantadora? It was very rare among us. Those ones who are called to carry the old stories. The Australians say that it's the old stories, that the old stories must be carried into the, pres the, the present in order for the future to exist. So in this moment, I'm asking you to get so clear with yourself. Why are you here? It's that big question, but I'm also going to invite you to wonder about what are you in service to? What are you in service to? Are you in service to connection? Are you in service to love? Are you in stir service of unity? I mean, I'm assuming that these are all the things. If you're drawn to me, you're probably, you know, in service to those things that are that are calling us together and to be in relationship to each other. And I ask that, that's actually one of the very first things that we work in in the realm of sacred storytelling. Because when you know what you're in service to, it's sort of like we become these like magnetic beings, right? And when we're in service to, you know, it's like those are the stories that will come to us. And we'll also have the discernment to understand, is that a story I'm willing to carry or is that not? I wanted to, I usually start with a quote, but today I really wanted to start with a little story I love the magic of, you know, good timing. And this friend of mine was reading this mystic story out of the Kabbalah. And he said, Leah, you gotta, you gotta have a story. And it was so beautiful that I really wanted to share it with you. I don't normally read stories, but this is so fresh and new. And I'm going to read it to you. And so this is a very mystic approach of storytelling. And this is the last paragraph of this whole book on Jewish mysticism and the Kabbalah. Um, it, it goes like this. When a Baal Shem had a difficult task before him, he would go to a certain place in the woods, light a fire, and meditate in prayer, and what he had set out to perform was done. When a generation later, the Magid, or Mazaritz, I'm proud of my, my pronunciation there, was faced with the same task, he would go to the same place in the woods and say, we can no longer light the fire, but we can still speak the prayers. And what he wanted done became reality. Again, a generation later, Rabbi Moshe Lieb of Sarav had, no, had to perform this task. And he too went into the woods and said, we can no longer light a fire, nor do we know the place in the woods to which it is all belongs. And that must be sufficient. And sufficient it was. But when another generation had passed and Rabbi Israel of Rishin was called upon to perform this task, he sat down on his golden chair in his castle and said, we cannot light the fire. We cannot speak the prayers. We do not know the place but we can tell the story of how it was done. And the storyteller adds, the story which he told had the same effect as the actions of the other three. This is a book on major trends in Jewish mysticism. And to me that holds, kind of one of the, that story holds this piece of what I've come to understand as a devotee of story and sacred storytelling is that stories have this kind of wild magic in them where they are capable to ignore the laws of this planet, which include entropy 
And we know that entropy, everything falls apart. Your house is going to fall apart. The tree is going to crumble. All the things are going to go, right? But stories can live on. And in this time when and there's in so many circles, when so many things are falling apart and so many systems are being revealed as really not working and are not in our best interest to be fully thriving on this planet, you know, in the kind of ecosystem that apparently we were designed to be here in. And when there's this, this desire among so many to remember and learn how to regenerate to ways that are sustainable on this planet, that little story to me held some of the greatest secrets that you might not know the practice, and you might not know the place, but if you can carry the story, you can hold the medicine and the power of the practice itself. That is like the secret of storytelling if I've ever heard it. I often think of stories, storytellers as being these kind of magical beings. Pardon me, I have to plug my computer in. They can live in the past, the present, and the future at once. Who else gets to do that? <laughs> and be present. That's just it. And be present. Okay, what's a story? Let's get into this. What is a story? This is a question for all of us. Here we are talking about this stuff. And you can speak out loud. You can um, put it in the chat box. We're asking, what is it? We're, we're wanting to get all on the same page. Hello, Shauna. Hi, Janet. It's always fun. Do you, do you want us just to speak out? Yeah. Oh, hi, man. This is Tucker Clark. And uh, I, I have followed many uh, a uh, master class. I'm a, I'm a senior citizen, age 76, in an assisted living home. But I was a psychiatric social worker. I worked with Save the Children and wow. in Ethiopia. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Nepal. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, the, in answer to your very simple question, mm -hmm. is that through a lot of people like Neil Donald Walsh and uh, 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 Chris uh, uh, <clears throat> Bache and all these people, I'm realizing that we all, in a way, create our own ego-based stories and it's it's a, a lot of us don't bring them out you know it's just that that's what rules us and what is a, a sort of an um and maybe this is getting ahead of what you want to be talking about but but uh, uh i i find that that it's just so rewarding now to be in this situation where i'm in a uh, you know a protected environment covid's not going to get me or no, it did. I, I got COVID, but Omicron. But uh, that that uh, I. But I'm I'm very much protected. I get three meals a day. I my I'm health care is. I'm going to ask you to bring this to a to a. Close yeah. So so uh, uh, the story. very very simple thing is that when we are aware that we all create these ego based things, then I want to be able to tell a sacred story that might involve a lot of. I, I call it based on a true story almost in terms of my own biography. So that's, that's the, uh, and thank you for this wonderful course. I look forward to it. God, pleasure to have you here. Thank you for sharing uh, the richness of life experience and the wondering that's brought you to this place. And I really, what I really heard you saying is like the power of stories, right? That they can take hold of us. And uh, let's like, let's really, um, let's, let's bookmark that piece. And, and I'm going to continue going on. Um, Lynn is saying, and sorry, I have to do this because sometimes my computer won't spotlight just on voice. Okay, <clears throat> for the recording. Lynn is saying that stories are using works to describe an experience imagined or real. Using works is described an experience is imagined or real. Love that. Words, thank you. Okay, using words. Okay. And Roy is saying it is the spirit of the past speaking out through us today. Okay, the spirit of the past speaking to us through today. I love that. Jeffrey is saying, what is a story? An instructive narrative. Okay. Any other ideas on what a story is? One of the ways that I look at story is that it's, you know, humans often refer to themselves in reference to the latest technology. So I'm going to use that kind of modality of thinking. 
We used to re refer to ourselves as in reference to machines. Now it's computers. And so I'm going to say, okay, well then, a computer is an operating system. I'm just going to pause for a second. So what are we doing? We're, we're using metaphor. What is metaphor? It's the language of spirit speaking to us through the story. Okay, stories actually speak in metaphors. They speak a different language. That's why that's why I'm so committed to this because it's almost a lost art to be in relationship to story itself. So if you look at story, it's, it's an operating system, and in that story, it teaches us our beliefs, our values, and what we believe is possible. So follow the language, right? Because our TV programming. It's right all there in the language, for heaven's sakes. And and so it's like, what were the original television shows that showed you what to expect from the world? What roles you could play? What were you gonna expect from love? What, you know, all the different things, right? How much money could you expect? How could you, what were you going to expect? How, you, how are you going to be expected to be treated? One, you know, really rough thing that we're working with, I love how awake we've become to our storytelling through the media. And now we're seeing, not just white people, you know, it's like we're understanding, no, there's a whole planet of all these different colors and all these different voices and all these different perspectives and our stories need to represent them because they are imprinting this idea of, of, what, of what life is, whether it's real or not, it's imprinting this idea. We can look at the impact of stories when we look at what is going on in our relationship in the police force and the fear, like what, you know, we're seeing the trigger happiness, you know, towards um, around the violence against black men in particularly, you know, where does that stem from? Is it possible that our television programming is playing a part in that when they show so much violence and so much fear? What's happening to women when they're showing that at one point, massive statistics that women are being shown as being raped in our television stories? You know, what, what does that train our young girls to expect from life? So I want to invite you to, we're putting on our sacred storytelling lenses and really coming to this place of examining the stories of our time and how are they consciously or unconsciously, right? As W. Tucker Clark having power over or power in our, com connecting into our power system, our life force power. Well, I was, you know, I taught that for a long time and I was just like on a walk the other day and I was like, that's horrible. I just hate. I hate leaving the story in that description because it's not it's not the fullness of what a story is. And I understand story as being much more of a library of our consciousness, a library of the soul. And that to me feels like a more whole expression of what is a story. Because our stories change and they transform the stories that I tell about my life or what I expect from my life are very different from the stories that my mother could have told and very different than my, what my grandmother could have told. And yet all of our stories are real and true and whole in the times that we're telling them. And as we tell them, we inform the capacity of those that are coming behind us. That's why it's so incredible to we can transform the most painful times in our lives into wisdom stories, right? So that, God, you didn't have to walk the same path that I had to if I got to learn the thing or two from the experience, right? That's, that's the evolutionary process when we get to transform those life initiations rather than just being wow that sucked you know being like oh i got initiated by life what did it call out in me what did it offer me that nothing else did so coming into these kinds of questions of like how do i give my gifts and could it be like the greatest challenges of my life is one of the greatest gifts that i can give to someone else because i learned a thing or two about how to be human and learn and live here and you don't need to make my mistakes you can learn from me and you can go on, or I can learn from you and go on. You know, it's like, it's, it's why it's like a really think of stories as being a major, playing a major role in our evolutionary consciousness. That's why it kind of breaks my heart when people come to a place and, and especially when I'm, when I'm sitting beside elders or olders and they say, I don't have any stories to tell. I'm like, oh, you know, what? I can't believe that. But what has happened in their world and in our society that would allow that belief system to live among them. You know, stories are powerful. So <clears throat> what's a sacred story? What's a sacred story? What makes it different? I, again, I want to jump in uh, because uh, one of the things that I think that you're alluding to is that a lot of us, and maybe I have the benefit of age on some of the people here that look like 
young youngsters. But uh, uh, or you look like a youngster. But uh, the, the the thing the thing is that that uh, I think that we always have had in the the uh, Aborigines in Australia know that there's a source within within us that uh, and Joseph Campbell talks about. You know the, the universal unconscious. Carl Jung talks about the universal unconscious, and that 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 uh, we we actually can, if we get past our ego function, meaning not 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 that you know we, we all talk about having a good ego. If you're you're a good health, uh, certified social worker, I understand, but that you know. So uh, we we've been taught that that you know to to try to develop a good ego. But what, what is really true is a lot of times when we go through a sort of like dark night of the soul, like Jesus and Buddha and everybody else did, that we can actually develop a kind of, 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 of uh, ability to communicate with the other, the, the, the source, which is part of all of us. And, and right, the, I love, I'm going to. I mean, yeah, I know, I know. I I I I love to go on. And on. <laughs> you have so much to share, is the thing. Thank <laughs> but that, no, so thank you for allowing me to, uh, you know, ramble <laughs> on. <laughs> Absolutely, and, you know, and and what I what I'm picking up and what you're sharing is right. There's this universal consciousness that lives in this in this being which we can't see. Right, the story it doesn't get to speak unless we say yes to it, right. And it's like, just think about it. Like if you can like put all the different stories that are right, right around you right now, like, you know, stories about money, stories about love, stories about uh, success, stories about what is what is failure. And it's like, they're all circling you, right? And then what do you choose to give life to? And that, that and like, what's, what's what, like, it only gets to live unless you decide you're the garden for the story. I love that. Thank you for giving us that way of talking about uh, what is the sacred story. So. It's got a life force inside of it. Um, I have an idea. Yes. Um, kind of concise. I think of it as like sharing the evolution of wisdom, a sacred story. So wisdom is like direct experience, right? And that, that's been assimilated. And then being able to share it in an evolutionary way for, for transformation would make it sacred to me. So this, and what I'm hearing in this is a participation and an engagement of like sharing my wisdom, being in connection with someone else and this um, generative relationship. Janet, I guess I had to call out Janet. Janet was in the very first story ceremony I ever did. <laughs> it was amazing. Her. It was so amazing. I still glean, I like will actually come through memories of little things that came through in that time it was so potent mm -hmm. and I think partially it's it's you obviously as the guide and then the material and then obviously the individuals we had I think it was like six of us but yeah the people that were called in for that original um kind of like opening of of your evolution of this process was so potent mm -hmm. it was such a gift Get to continue to play with you yeah i feel really lucky like there are there are really delightful people that come towards this there's a resonance and yeah we want to be part of the story of our time and we want to be alive and we want to be aware of our who we are as conscious creators lynn i see your hand up yeah i mean i had typed this too but i'll use my voice <laughs> um so i said a sacred story would be something rooted in source which is very general but for me it has a quality of being divinely guided and sharing a truth and so for me that sacred story that truth serves humanity's highest good and there's many flavors of story for all of us different types of humans but i'm seeing an evolution Mm -hmm. You know, there's very obviously anyone who's looked at different stories sees this common archetypal thread. So that's I, when you just spoke me. that it serves humanity's highest good. I literally got chills. And I think I think you actually say it better than I say it. <laughs> it <is yours. laughs> I just said it as sacred stories serve serve um, the thriving of all beings. You know that, that how do I know that this is a sacred story? you know, that it is serves humanity's highest good. 
it serves the thriving of all beings, meaning that, and, and so this is, in, especially we're in the era of information, and I, I want to pause here to be like, we are made of stories. Humans, our first language was symbol, you know, it's like we, and stories are made of symbols, and so, and, and metaphor, and, and we're made of stories, and stories are how we make meaning, it's how we make sense of the world. You know, when we think about those first origin stories, they were all metaphors and they were all instructional guides for how to be in relationship with the earth. You know, when we think of creation stories, they, they tell us how the world works, literally. It's, it's the, here's the guidebook, here's how the planet works, you know, here's your place in it. Um, and yet when, we, when we're in the era of information, and I also wanna speak about one other thing, when we're in a storied way, in a storied culture, you get to hear the voice of a storyteller you get to see their body your animal instincts are on board you know one of our guest teachers is um going to be coming in from uh originally he's from greenland and he um would do this he, he talks about how when they first come together that they actually they don't say hello they don't ask how you are they smell each other they come and they they just take a, a, a they catch the scent of each cheek and they can sense their emotions. Okay, these are people that are still very alive in their animal instincts. And I say this because when we are in a world that's filled with stories and we're in connection to the people who are telling those stories, our animal bodies are able to read all the information. Is this person trustworthy? You know, does this person have my best interest in mind? You know, you can feel all these things, but we're living in a time of information. And so we don't know the source of our information. We don't know the source of the creator. We don't know what they're in service to, right? So then we're in this, we're in the game of resonance, okay? Does that story have fear? Do I have fear in me? Do we meet? Yes, you know, does that story have possibility? Do I have possibility? Do we meet? Hopefully. You know, does that story have optimism? Do I have optimism? Hopefully, you know, so it's like it's this, it's a real um, tricky time that we are living in as being storied people and being disconnected from our storytellers and being disconnected from ourselves as humans. One of the things that that human part of ourselves and as someone who worked in the environmental movement for a very long time, I skip telling you guys my stories. Sometimes I do these classes, you know, very often, and I kind of get bored with telling my own story just because I find it more exciting to talk about stories than myself. But a little bit part of my journey is that I entered into the world of really, you know, I was born in a time where like, oh my God, we got to race to save the planet. And that was indoctrinated into me at a very young age. And I really did. I also really loved theater and writing and storytelling. And I went off, studied theater professionally in New York City, learned that the business of, of, of theater is kind of a, a weird world that I was not gonna have fun in and went on to um, get uh, my college degree where I was really introduced to the wilderness. And I came into this place of really coming to, if we can't actually save ourselves, we can't save the planet. That was, I would say that was kind of like the beginning of my own thought process. Now I don't use the word save. I don't think anybody needs to be saved. If we're trying to get the savior complex, you know, it's like, oh my God, the, 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 the story of victimhood that we're buying into. If you, W. Tucker Clark, have to be saved, what am I saying to, my, to you and me if I believe that story? You know, I'm agreeing that I have more life force power, access to more life force power than you do. Well, uh, no, that's not true. You know, so the, <clears throat> I say all this because coming back to this idea of this, how do we really have an impact and influence on on the times that we're living in? And that was part of my weaving of my journey. You know, how do I stand as a healer for these times? How do I be part of the restoration and regeneration? Again, it's not about saving the planet. That's going to be fine. You know, my journey ended up taking me to working with Al Gore and producing and hosting the Green Channel. And I got to see right then and there what it, how amazing it was to be able to be a, a voice for the earth and to give people uh, that would normally never be on TV, like a Greenpeace live action. You know, like we live streamed, you know, live actions from Greenpeace and put it on TV. Like nobody else was doing that. It was so much fun. But I also got to see the data and the data was showing me people weren't watching the data. They were watching the stories and that gave me permission to go fully into where the genius that lives through me which is in storytelling and i want to say just want to pause when i say that because i'm not saying oh my god it's not an ego statement because we all have a genius that lives through us you know it's going back to how michael mead speaks to that spirit of genius in rome when they celebrated your birthday they weren't celebrating you they were celebrating the genius that lived through you 
you know i love that so it's like and it's it, to me it's like the one of the great uh you know adventures in life is finding ah where does that genius live through me you know that brilliance of the life experience with it where it's just there for you so coming back around to this idea of of what is a sacred story and why is it so important and and that through all those studies I really came to and being working on the front lines and going to the climate talks, the UN climate talks and being in the media machine and really seeing it from the inside out. I really came to that the earth's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. We are just a, a little blip on her radar and and wow we're in a situation and we're waking up to what it is to be creators on this planet because we are creators we can't help but create that is our very nature we are on a creator planet i'm going to pause here and go all the ancients believe that the earth was sung spoken and chanted into existence i'm going to say it again because this is like kind of mind-blowing when you understand this is one of the first wisdom teachings from all the ancient religions agree that the world was sung spoken and chanted into existence so it's like from the very beginning we know that we're creators and we create through how we speak so coming into this place of like now there's all this shame stories going on where people are bad for the planet that is that story in service of where is this line that i just love so much <laughs> humanity's highest good i don't think it is i think that's a dangerous story so when we come back to this idea of i think the planet's going to be fine I think there's going to be a lot of structure and restructuring. I don't know that all the humans are going to make it through this, whatever we're going to go through. I have no idea. Probably the more you understand how to learn with the earth, the better. There's probably going to be a great separation. Those who want to live on earth, those who don't, I don't know, you know, but a lot of humans are probably going to make it through. I think what's really at stake and the thing that I'm really committed to is our humanity, because I think our humanity is at stake. How will we live with ourselves if we created a place for other beings such as trees and plants and icebergs and wild boar can't live with us. Can I jump in for a half a second too? I'm gonna, if, if it's really half a second. I, I, I worked on with Greenpeace in 1990 on World Alerts. And right now I realize that I have a, uh, a, a radical side of me that wanted to make everybody wrong in the divisiveness and I would in Fox News and all this other Republican Party and all these things. And that's part of non sacred st studies, uh, stories, and that that uh, to be able to plug into other things is really important to me. So I just wanted to say that to you, because it's, it, it's not going to be fine unless we all take on our sacred st st stories. I, I love that. And you know, what I love about what you just talked about is this idea. And here's why I love getting to stand in the world of sacred storyteller. It's when you when you live in the world of sacred storyteller, I feel like you've got the keys to liberation. Okay, you get the you get the get out of jail free card, because you get out of that dualistic thinking of that there is a right and a wrong. And you get to get it's like I teach a class that's called uh, tell a bigger story. It's like, how big can your story become when there's space for all the things? We know you can't have the dark without the light. You know, it's like that we need these opposing factors. And when you learn how to tell a story, you get to understand what it is to have healthy conflict versus drama. That's a whole other side thing that we don't really have time to talk about, but think about that in your life. You know, it's like I, and when I was working on peace studies, it was like, no, we're looking for peaceful conflict, not the avoidance of conflict. You know, conflict creates change. So. Um, I'm just really going wildly off script today because you guys are so fun and inspiring all different kinds of things. I'm just gonna read a couple more of these. Allison says, I love this concept. Ah, that your story becomes someone else's survival guide. Seriously, it's like throwing breadcrumbs. I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys one of those stories, an example of how to create your own wisdom story. I can tell there are people here that are for that. Jeffrey Thumball is saying a sacred story possibly taps into and reveals wider, more universal, primary, mythical lessons and principles. Well, it possibly taps into reveals wider, more universal primary. You know, John Steinbeck says that you must tell a story about the reader or the story will not exist. And that to me, it's like, even when I tell you my personal story, if I am at the place where I'm taking the stage to tell you the story, the story is no longer about me, it's about you. Because I'm telling the story for you. 
there's a time in a healing process and I do teach a class that's all about working with story as a tool for healing and 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 when we're doing that there's a time in, in that story process where you actually just have to be witnessed and that's when you're telling a story for me so I might call a healing story circle and say I need something to be witnessed I need something to be heard I need something to be received we know this in all the reparation work that some of the key stages in this reparation work is that people can be witnessed and just listened to. But when you take the, the stage as a storyteller and you're saying, okay, I'm gonna give you a story. It's not, I would say, because you need to be listened to or because you need to be witnessed. It's because you're further down the path in your own evolution of what it is to be on the path of becoming an elder and knowing that you have something to give and that it's of value. So when you speak, when I speak a story, it's not just that I'm telling you the story. It's that underneath it, I'm saying that you're so valuable, that your life is so valuable, that I'm willing to touch the spark of life itself, if that will ignite the spark in you. And that can be dangerous business to step into the flame of the muse. I think about that because we have a lot of warnings at 27 Club, right? All those amazing musicians that just whoosh, came so close to the flame and kind of lost the capacity to be human, you know? So this, this I, I feel like we're in this extraordinary evolutionary time where we're really learning what does it mean to be a conscious creator and how can I bridge this relationship with the unseen world and that source of life? How can I be a vessel for that? And brush my teeth in the morning, have a healthy relationships, be someone that wants people want to hang out with, you know, and enjoy life as a human. And I feel like that is a great task. Um, Randall's saying that a sacred story is an archetypal story. Yes, Gilgamesh, Aina, the quest of the hero, the divine mother. Yeah, and that archetypal, again, we're getting to that universal piece. So here's the thing about calling something a sacred story. It's a complete setup. And I'm sorry to say that. Um, and it's it's a it's a it's a setup in terms of how we employ that language, because by saying <clears throat> this hair clip is a sacred hair clip, you know, well, what does that mean about this mug? It's not sacred. It didn't once have the life force within it. This is an animistic perspective of seeing the life in all beings. But okay, well, what if we call that mountain sacred? And we protect it, but the one next to it isn't sacred, so we don't protect it. You know, it's, it's so it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a setup in terms of how do we employ the language. So if I had my druthers, you know, we put the word activism out of business. You know, because hopefully everyone's engaged. We don't have to separate people just because they're engaged with doing things that are for, you know, in theory, all of our great good. So the same thing with this word sacred. Can we work the word sacred out of the job because we are all, but because we we do call on it because what does it bring us to? It brings us into this say, saying, okay, I'm in relationship with the divine. I see you as a divine being. I see the divinity in you. I see the life force in you. I honor that. Okay, so we're, we call on that language to say, yes, story, I see the life force in you, I see the spirit, maybe other people call it the muse, or the ancestors, or as Sean Kane says, the earth speaking out loud comes through our stories. So you're like, okay, that's fine, the sacred stories, they're, they're in our life thriving, they're good for our greatest good. Um, so what's a zombie story? I'm going to invite you to really put on your sacred story goggles. And I think of this, right? Because it's like when you when you put on your goggles, if any of you guys, I love snorkeling, right? But if you go in the ocean without your goggles and you open your eyes, <clears throat> it's like, what do you see? But it's all kind of like murky. You can't really see through it. And this is such a great metaphor because what is ocean represents but our consciousness, right? And so when you put on your goggles to go swimming into the ocean of consciousness, now you can see clearly. And so put on your sacred story goggles and be like, okay, looking at all the stories around you, are they in service of my greatest self? Are they planting fear or are they planting possibility? You know, are they warning me about what is no longer okay? Are they reflecting back and say, this is not acceptable. Here's an option, you know, or are they creating a paralyzing effect? Is there a role for me in that story? I'd say that's one of the reasons why I think the current climate narrative is such a dangerous story because it doesn't leave us with a role to play. You know, I don't see myself in a great future based on that story. 
It's a broken story. So, um, and by the way, on April 22nd, we'll be working with, on, on Earth Day, we'll be working in the story ceremony, healing that story together. So just putting a little seed for that. Um, one example of a zombie story that I'm just going to share with you right now is uh, Jaws. And Jaws was, when we're going back to the creator, who was the creator? You know, Peter Benchley was the writer of that story. Who is the creator that's most known for it? Steven Spielberg. It was the very first film that he ever made. What was his intention? What was he in service to? He wanted to get recognized to be a great famous director, right? He knew it would make people look. They produced that film. It was the very first film ever produced on the open ocean. Okay, what is the ocean? It's whether you consciously speak universal symbols, they speak to you and through you. It's a symbol of our consciousness. They bring in this great big metal shark, the metal shark breaks. They're smart producers. They decide to show just little pieces of it. Now, all of a sudden, boom, symbol. We're no longer looking at a dumb prop of some metal shark. We're looking at the symbol of the shark, which now represents humans' oldest and greatest known fear, fear of death. What happens to, that, to those sharks is that it becomes perfectly acceptable to a very large amount of people around the globe in terms of their fears getting amplified beyond belief to murder off those species, which are a keystone to our own well-being on the, in the ocean. When Peter eventually started to see the impact and influence of the story that he brought to life, he spent the rest of his life as an ocean protector trying to bring healing and restoration to it. So I say this as a warning story because I don't think that all bad that these are bad people creating zombie stories, but I say it to you it's like how can we learn from their mistakes. How conscious and awake can you be to the stories that you are bringing in and their impact and influence on the world, which will live longer than your own life. So it's like we can give these gifts or we can give things that we're going to be I don't know tending to and cleaning up for a while. Side note, I don't know if it's true, but I kind of love it. They say that more people die every year from coconuts falling out of trees onto their heads than people from shark attacks. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a wisdom story. Do you guys want a wisdom story? Like a, a little, okay. So um, this is a recipe for how to tell a story. I say it's a recipe because, you know, I asked my, my mom's an amazing cook. She's also a painter. She's an amazing cook. And, um, and I said, mom, I really want a, 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 a book of your recipes. And instead, she gave me a book of her paintings and stories from our home. She's like, I don't cook by recipes. <laughs> and like, and, and I, that to me is like exactly it. It's like the story, I don't want to, t I don't want to tell you how to create a clone, clone a story. And there's a lot of cloned stories out there because we understand the mechanisms of how we work. So the bop, 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 bop. But where's the life in that story? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you into um, a recipe where you can find how the life of the story wants to emerge and be expressed through you. Okay, so the number one key when approaching a sacred story is make life for the spirit. Okay, that means you got to give your ego the day off. Okay, that means that you got to go to your story and, and say, um, you know, if it's a wisdom story, uh, I like taking wisdom stories out of times that really sucked. So think about that time in your life that really sucked. You kind of wish it hadn't happened. You're definitely not going back there. And now you want to make that time kind of part of your soul stories. You know, it's, it's a soul, it's a, it's a story of your soul. So um, you have to be, there's only, there's only a couple rules out of it, of, of a wisdom story. You have to be on the other side. Okay, so you can't still be in it. If you're still in it, we talk about creating a medicine story, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about creating a wisdom story. And you have to be willing, W. Tucker Clark, plant of the seed, you have to be willing to not be right. Okay, so if someone wronged you, you just have to be willing you have to be willing to approach the story as if you are uh, uh, an innocent, okay? Coming to it with fresh eyes, with a fresh perspective and allow the story to emerge. What we're doing with a wisdom story is we're looking for the story that's bigger than your human experience. We're looking for the story that lives in your soul, okay? So <clears throat> we've got the rules, we've got the foundation. Um, the first question that you like to ask is, where does the story really begin? Where does the story really begin? Um, <coughs> when I, the other thing I'm just going to plant before we go into this is that because this is a story of your soul, we're looking at your story as now not just a sucky thing that happened to you, but some experience in your life that initiated you. This is an experience in life that initiated you. Okay. So if I were to tell you the story, of when I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, 
That story did not begin on the day that I showed up at the right doctor finally after searching for a long time and he handed me this contract and he said he was going to cut across my throat. It's not, that's not the day that story started. The story began when I was four years old. See, my mother, who was a painter I told you about, had all these artist friends and they would make me this kind of cool things and one of them had made me this embroidered um, picture on my wall and it was of this woman giving flowers to all these children and embroidered into this tapestry it said give what you have Leah it might mean more than you dare to think and I remember being four years old and just learning how to read and, and like reading over and over and over again give what you have Leah I mean she wrote my name in it so I really need, knew that I had to get the message it might mean more than you dare to think. And I didn't know what I had until all of a sudden I was sitting across from a doctor who was telling me that they were going to cut across my throat and there was a very good chance that I could lose my voice. And then I knew what I had. Okay, so I'm just taking a pause here. It's, it's about having a moment. If I sat down there to try to tell you my story and I was like, well, once upon a time, look, I might never have made this kind of connection, right? But I'm telling a bigger story, the story of a soul. And remember, I'm telling a story about you. This is now a universal story. This is a story about us, the human condition. So it's about opening kind of the, the hatch and allowing yourself to be inspired. You know, I couldn't have consciously made that connection. It was the inspiration that was like, let's connect the constellation of your life. That's what we're doing. We're, we're connecting the dots to create the constellation to show the bigger picture. Okay. So another part is, you know, you're being initiated by life. <clears throat> and so something's got to go, right? We know this about thresholds. Something's going to be lost. Something's on the other side. The rules about, about initiations, not everyone makes it through. We know this. How many people do you know had their heart broken and were never able to love again? How many people had something horrific happened and never caught hold of their life force again? You know, so it's like, you know that something happened. And what you're doing as a storyteller is you're trying to make sure that you make it through. And this is, these are the, we don't have, right, COVID-19, very big initiation. You're in a massive initiation, you know. So <clears throat> listen to the language, we're being tested. It's in our language, right? I love that. So it's like, um, so when we're looking at this initiation and you're looking at it, so you know that something's gotta go, but you never know what it is until you're in it. You know that something's on the other side and something's gonna be called out, but you don't know what that's gonna be until you go through that threshold. So here we go. Um, for me, when that man told me that there was a very good chance I could lose my voice, something snapped. Because something that you don't know about me right now is that previous to that part of my life, I had mastered the victim archetype. I had many experiences where I had, I could, I had learned the language, the role. I could out victim story anybody in the room. It almost became a sport. And all of a sudden, this guy, it was like he was coming to me with like this perfect purple velvet pillow with the, the, the tiara to be queen victim, losing your voice. I mean, that, that's something to cry about. And this thing in me just came online. I was like, I am not going to be a victim anymore. And as soon as I declared that within me, and I can't tell you, I can't tell you that I consciously did it, right? Something in my soul came online all of a sudden. And when that happened, when something inside me just declared not again, that all of a sudden it was just like this window opened up in the door of this room. And I just jumped through the other side. And what was on the other side? was humor. I was like, ah, oh, you just say that to all the pretty girls, too, don't you? He was like, well, no, you might really lose your voice. But I found something in me that I hadn't found before, which is rather than coming into this place of poor me, poor me, poor me, bringing it towards me, I found this place of going, oh, what do I have to give the situation? And in this moment, I could make people laugh. It was a coping mechanism. It was a very effective coping mechanism because every time I went in to have my blood drawn, every time I went to see another nurse or a doctor or was doing research or blah, 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 I had a job and it was to make people laugh so that we could laugh together because it was way more fun laughing together than me sobbing and crying. So again, it's like we're, we're throwing breadcrumbs behind us 
you know, and it's not like anyone's going to walk in your exact path, but who knows at those moments that are going to come alive in them after hearing, after hearing your story. So there's always going to be a guide. So here's another part of your recipe. There's always going to be a guide that gets you through. There's going to be a Yoda. There's going to be a fairy godmother. And this role is, is outside of your family system. And so consider what was it that got you through? For me, it was a garden. You see, right after I came out of that six hour operation, they, they just give you kind of any old medicine that they know how to give you. They don't know the exact amount. They have to like give it to you and see how your body responds <clears throat> when they take out your thyroid. And um, for me, they gave me speed. And I was just like, woohoo! I started losing weight. I felt so good. I just like jumped out of the hospital. I like you know, called up my friends. I was like, let's make a 70 foot spiral garden. They're like, Leah, you're crazy. I was like, I know I've got all this energy. Let's use it. And so they came over to my house and we built this 70 foot spiral garden. And thank God we did. Because after about two weeks of being on speed, I fell into a deep, deep, deep depression. And I'd never experienced depression like that. I'll never forget walking down the road and seeing this light fall in a leaf and knowing in my mind that there had been a time when something like that would give me pleasure and now everything just looked black and white. And all I had was energy was to get up, to go to work, and to come back. There was no like joy of life in between. But every morning I would get up and I would walk the spirals of that garden. And I would say my gratitude. And gratitude was not popular. I was not in any kind of religious community. Nobody taught me about it. Oprah wasn't talking about it. That earth gave me that. To be in a place of gratitude. And I was grateful for my life. And on, as I walked out of that spiral, I said my prayers. And once again, I didn't know anything about prayer. It was not something that had been in my practice. That garden taught me about prayer. And every day I prayed. I prayed for my life. I prayed for this path. And those prayers are what brought me to you today. So you're sharing what's coming alive and on board in your life and you're sharing what you learned okay so you're, you're you're getting the gems of your experience and then you're sharing them with other people okay now it's there's ending a story is an art form it requires some craft and technique to do it really well but i'm going to teach you to do it really fast i learned this technique from carolyn casey she learned it from john o'donohue and um you end with a story blessing Okay, so, so you come to the end of your piece, and this is why you can leave this spice in about five minutes, and you can just go write your own story. I, I, can, I actually wrote that story in five minutes for a storytelling contest. Um, so this, this the story blessing, it's, it's, it's if then, that's kind of the, 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 the structure of it. If you find yourself, you're looking for a metaphor that encapsulates your story. Okay, if you find yourself in a dark and stormy night, and your ship has sunk, and all seems lost as if there is nothing left to hang on to. Then, may the light of the moon rest on the surface of that ocean and show you the path through the waves until you make it to land again. And then you leave people with a blessing and being blessed and they're not paying attention that you didn't finish your story. Um, so that's that is a recipe for how to uh, create a wisdom story, um, and that completes our class today. And so I hope you feel really rich and enriched and enlivened in, in the world of sacred storytelling. If you feel complete, I wish you would do. If you like something came on board and you're like, wait a second, I want to tell my stories and I want to be joining a world of sacred storytelling and I want to do story ceremonies and hang out with a bunch of master teachers who really love doing this. Um, what is this whole thing about becoming a conscious creator? Then uh, stay on for about five more minutes and I'll tell you about what's happening. So um, that's what I'm going to do for about the next five 
five or eight minutes it will be will be efficient so um all of this led me into you know this this collaboration of really wanting to you're welcome you're welcome you're welcome um uh this this place of really wanting to be in a place of weaving together this passion for the planet you know and like how is it that we come to this place of we're in a, we're living in a times that are really asking the most of us and and when we show up for that like how do we live our life in a way that that we feel proud that we're humans you know that we're part of the restoration and the healing of these times and bringing humans together in a time when so much is trying to pull us apart and as i looked at my own journey both through you know what is it to be in relationship with land you know how do we be good humans together and getting a master's in social work and working with youth at risk for many many years and then coming to this place of this environmental crisis and really weaving this thread of environmental passion for the environment and passion for social justice passion for humans passions for community and connection and to me it all comes together in the circle of story and specifically what it is to be a sacred storyteller and at the center of that is what it is to be a conscious creator so it was really that state of wonder and um listening that where this program emerged and i'll even tell you that um the myth magic and medicine which is what um oh she's gone now uh janet was in was the very first class that i ever taught and it literally came through a prayer and it, and it's the foundation for the whole program but just know your myths know your stories know where they come from recognize them you know but it's also like learn the old stories learn what an old myth is like what is a story then you know learn who you are as a magician and that first story that i read to you was talking about how they knew that language was magic you know that those that those old rabbis could go and they could speak the prayers and what they were calling for would come to pass you know and understanding kind of this ancient mystic approach to what it is to be a creator and what it is to be a magician and what it is to what is magic but it is it, it's it is um, conspiring to align with the energies you know so and then understanding myth magic medicine that your stories are medicine that even the hardest most roughest times can be alchemized and brought to be a healing salve for our times. When you go through this process of working with story as a tool for um, for healing and transformation. And so what I would say is, is that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys some links. And if you were really interested, I would grab these links only because um, our, you know, communication and, and emails, they go into spam, they go into drafts, they go into all different kinds of places. Um, why am I speaking so quietly? Jeffrey's asking. I don't know. Did the voice just go down? <clears throat> I have a slight. I have a. I. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's just how it's talking today. <laughs> um, so that is what you're going to see right there. That is going to give you the overview of of the School for Sacred Storytelling, and what it is is I'm just going to tell you without going to the page right now. But basically, as I have been teaching for over five years now. And I've taught, you know, both a lot of live classes. I've been teaching online for over four years. And I used to teach this nine month program. And I'd bring in all these guest teachers and incredible people like like Michael Mead and Carolyn Casey and, and Charles, Charles Eisenstein and Stephen Jenkinson. And and it was incredible. And I what I would notice it was that people would sign up and they would come to about half the program. And they all liked it, but there wasn't there, there wasn't that glue that was like carrying through them through to like the other side. And I'm much more interested in people having an more like uh, coming into that intimate relationship with that creative life force and having an incredible experience telling their stories and just getting people's money for a program. That's not what drives me. So I really wanted to come back and be like, well, how can I create a program that really serves people where they absolutely get the most out of it? And what came to me was this working in, in these smaller modules. So what we do now is we work in these modules that are six weeks long and four weeks long, and we take breaths, um, breaks in between. So half these courses are, they're called sanctuary self-discovery courses. And these are really getting at who are you as a conscious creator? You know, where is your energy stuck? 
You know, where is it not flowing? Where are you not getting full access to your life force? Because I was seeing that even though I was teaching people the skills and the techniques and the ways to tell a story, if they were stuck, if they were like a doubt and the critic and the judge and all those things were just banging at their brain, they couldn't get to the pleasure and the joy of coming forth to give what they, the gift that they have to give. So I was like, we've got to get in there and get to that conscious creator place. So what I, what I'll show you right here is how the program works. And then I'll take you on a little tour of um, the course that's happening right now that you can actually jump in on if you're feeling like this is for you. So the way that it works is that it's designed to go through your entire body. So this, these are the discovery modules. Right now we're in arrows. We're looking at that, that second chakra. And I've realized that this material is very <clears throat> confrontational to a lot of people where they're like, whoa, arrow sex second chakra but it's it's bigger than that it's our creation it's our creation energy it's our creativity it's our power it's how we express ourselves it's how we don't express ourselves our sexuality our, our sensuality it's all the stories that we're told about what's allowed what's not and so we're going in and it's a very what i'll tell you it's a very gentle journey into really looking at how how are you in relationship or out of alignment with your life force energy and we're we're using all kinds of play this is it we come into that relationship of play play is an advanced skill it means that you can like you can actually like fall and get up it means that you can come to the edge of comfort and keep going so we do this in a really fun group we call it the group of greatness where we really come into a culture where we are committed to looking for each other's greatness and calling it out in each other so it's a really fun supportive community um, we just started that first class. Our, our, the, the first assignment has been given. We've, we've been with our first guest teacher, but our next class isn't until Tuesday. Registration ends on Monday. So if you're feeling like, yeah, I want to do this, you've got time to catch up and join us. And I'll give you a, a link on that in a second. <clears throat> the, so the rest of the program, so we're going to, after that, we take two weeks off. We're going to come out and we're going to tell our wisdom stories. So we're going to have four weeks to really work on, develop, practice, um, rehearse, and then we end with a little storytelling festival. Super fun. There's poems, there's songs, we play. It's just like life is good. It's just like life is a good moment. Um, then we take another two weeks off. We come out, okay, let's get into shine, your power and your purpose, right in that third chakra. And then again, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. We come out to tell our medicine stories. Our medicine stories are all about how do you work with, with, um, story is a tool for healing. So if you're someone who's really is, who is in the healing arts, or if you're looking to really do your own self discovery, that's a great course. And we come out unity, we're looking at love, love of self, love of other love of land. Um, and then we come out to do teaching stories. Teaching stories is almost a lost art. Many people don't even know how to create a teaching story. It's not a story that makes a point of view, but it actually teaches people how to live in the world. And it's um, much more of an indigenous form of teaching of, of, of storytelling. And so we're going to get to touch the spark of that. Then we come out to third chakra. Um, I always call it the third chakra. It's the fifth chakra. <laughs> It's the, the throat chakra, speak your spark. This is where we're really looking at where is your voice being blocked? Where is it not coming forth? What are the things that you really want to protect? And it's the class where we really come into the practice of using our voice in the outside world for things we really care about. <clears throat> Let me come out to Cantadora. Cantadora is carrying the old stories and it's almost a lost art. A lot of those old stories are being lost and we and we learn how to handle them in respect and reverence for what they are and also looking at how do we carry them in our times. So it's a difference between just because a story is an old story doesn't mean it deserves to be carried. <clears throat> so we look a lot about discernment. Um, and then we're going into vision stories. Vision stories is a really fun, uh, it's, a, it's the way that this program it's, it's 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 either the end or the beginning of the program, depending on how you start. And we're looking at how do we plant the seeds of a of a vision of the future that we most want to live. And it's a really fun technique that I teach in terms of you can do it in groups. So <clears throat> the way that this program is designed is that you can actually jump in at any time. So we're in the third module. You can go back. You can watch the other ones and catch up to be with us or you can say i just want to join and i want to actually just do the cycle so imagine it like a cycle like the seasons 
they go all the way through and just kind of like when you're <laughs> I came up with this metaphor this morning sort of just like when you're born you know it's like when you're born it doesn't matter you know it's like it could be fall spring or summer like the seasons of life are continuing and then you jump on at that time and it's sort of like that with this program the seasons of this program are going and then um and, that, and then that happens the other things i'm just going to tell you about this program is that we have a couple of key things that are that are very unique one of them is, you know, I told you about the, the, the six week discovery courses. Those are all supported by guest teachers. So we have an incredible array of over 35 guest teachers from around the world. Some of them are very famous and you've heard of them. Some of them you don't know them, but they're emerging with new ideas that are so worthy to hear and they're, they're really um, masterful at what they have to teach. I also host five day story ceremonies. That's what Janet was talking about. She was in my very first one. Uh, this is something that's very unique when we're looking at how do we use this energy as a place where we can do healing as a collective and heal some of the most destructive or challenging stories of our time. And the other thing that happens that you get in this program is you get a group of greatness. That's what I love. So it's like, it's sort of like needle and thread. You come to class, you're poking holes in all the different things. And then you have this group that you can, if you want, you don't have to meet with them outside of class. Um, and then you also, as part of the year long program, you get a free um, membership to our membership program at Ready Networks. So you might be saying, oh, I just wanna be part of a community and get to have writing classes. This is what this offers is that we, we, we meet every Wednesday for a free writing time where we get a, uh, a writing prompt, we write and we can share what, what happens there. We also have a book reading club where we're reading books and discussing them. And then I also have open office hours where anyone can just drop by and we can just talk about what's happening. You know? um, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but I, I think I just talked to you about the story. I'll just tell you the story, the story ceremonies. This goes on and on and on and on and on. Lordy me. Oh, here's some of the pictures of some of the story ceremonies that we did. These were done with advanced performance groups. And um, this was done with Story of Medea. We had it was, uh, six students and 200 guests came to experience that story ceremony with us. And so these are the story ceremonies that we're doing this year. <clears throat> we're going to be doing them live. So if you're in Southern California, you can participate live or we'll also be doing them online. So that's going to be a dual experience. Our next one that's coming up is going to be the story of Earth's Becoming. And it's um, really looking about taking another another look at what if we're what if we're part of a great initiation that the earth is going through and we have a very important role to play. I'm not going to go through all of these because you got the link to the website, but you can see that this is a very full and integrated program. And so um, what I'll, I will go down here and just tell you about prices because I know people are going to ask about this, you can go all through this. So the program as it works right now is that if you're if you're saying wow I want this entire program and why is it worth doing the whole program you know it's like people it's like it's a good thing to wonder about because it's a commitment and what I know as someone who has a, who has a practice of writing and creating and as someone who's been a professional creator and producer my whole life when you commit to something it commits to you it's kind of this magic you know it holds you even when even when you don't want to do it it's like it, it, the ego doesn't get to play as much and what I know about this program is that a lot of people have gone through this program. And I used to just say, I just teach storytelling. And that's what I used to say, I just teach storytelling. And then I realized I wasn't telling the whole truth. And I was like, okay, I guess I should start telling people the whole truth. That what we're doing here is creating a beautiful space where people can go through um, a real healing journey. And where if you want to change, and if there's something in you that wants to come alive, that this is a place to come and practice it. And so what people are getting at the end of their program is like extraordinary confidence as storytellers and using their voice, working through blocks and barriers. And they're also getting this, this opportunity to really stand in the position of, of leadership and learning facilitation skills and learning like real concrete skills of how to be in community. Katie, I see your hand. I'm gonna call on you just a second. Um, and so in terms of the program, in terms of this whole comprehensive program, it's a year and a half worth of material. That's how long the program is, no matter when you start. And you can either, if you are feeling that commitment, say yes. When you pay full, you get a pretty substantial discount. And if you're like, ah, I can't do that, then there's a payment plan. And so we do payment plans with people. I also have two different work exchange roles available right now. So um, that is an option if you're feeling, wow, I need some financial support in this and can't do the whole payment plan. Um, then we have some roles to do that. 
And so what I would say is like, if you're really feeling passionate about it and you need some support figuring out how to make it work, then just email info at leonlam.com. I'm putting this in there and that is available to you. Um, Katie, I hear your, I see your question. I'm also gonna give you guys a link for arrows so that you have that. Katie, do you have, do you wanna ask a question? You're just raising your, giving me a high five. Does anyone else have a question? Um, Cassandra? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to start off by really thanking you for this offering and thanking you for the work that you do. I love that your modules correspond to the chakras. And the question that I have is, do you suggest as uh, the leader and the facilitator of this process that we enter into the cycle in a place where we feel some mastery over that particular chakra or do you suggest that we start maybe where we have trouble accessing um, that chakra um, or it does it matter you know it really doesn't matter and it's like, what I would say is, A, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for seeing and receiving this work so beautifully. And um, I would say like, if you're feeling the call, like why put it off? I mean, it sounds like a kind of a funny thing to say. It's like, I always tell people when they ask me if, if, if it's for them, I just say, come back to your bones. And if you're feeling a yes, if you're feeling a tickle, if you're feeling a little bit of fear and like that butterfly, and it's like, to me that says, oh, something's trying to emerge. And there's also some energy that's in there that's kind of like, oh, this could be challenging. Um, Eros is a beautiful class. And on what I would say, it's like, it's like, go to where, go to where you feel a little bit of challenge. You know, because what do you do the work for? You know, it's like if it's something that you feel like you have full mastery in, then do you need a class for that? <laughs> you know, it's like I like to go to the places where like, oh, where am I going to get to grow? Where am I going to get to shift? What's going to give me an opportunity to move through something that I haven't been able to move through on my own? And to me, that's like the power of coming into community. And I would say I do do evergreen classes, meaning that you can go back and you can watch the recordings and I make that possible so that people can have it. But if you're going to ask me where the real medicine is and where the real magic of this work is, it's where we get to come in together in community. Because as Anita comes through something and she comes through an awareness and she comes through and she tells her story, we all get to receive that medicine, you know? And so it's something, it's like, I always tell people, don't do a class by yourself. Make sure that you do it in community because storytelling is meant to be done in community. And so that to me is the power of coming into that live experience. Um, I also just put the link in for the Eros class and I can for anyone that wants to see that we are registering for that right now as we speak and you have until Monday so I can walk through that. Um, any other questions. Okay, I'm just going to show you Eros because you can see our guest speakers and all of these guys are amazing so here we have Eros this is all about again. Uh, again, I, I've noticed that people are like, whoa, arrows, no, sexuality, ah, and it's like, it's really, it's like this source of your creativity, that's what we're going for, and this is where I like to show people the, the wide variety of classes that we're doing, so these are our guest teachers who are supporting your journey, and it's really designed, someone came in, and I'll tell you, the people that are in there, there's a little bit of trepidation, they're like, this is a little provocative for me, I don't know how comfortable I am with this material, and we only go as fast as you can, I was thinking about um, one of my favorite healers, I really, if you guys are on Maui, the, uh, the most profound healer I've ever met is Jorg in terms of, of working with muscles. And he comes in and he, he's able to come and work with your muscles in such a gentle way that they find themselves into alignment. You know, so he's not one of those chiropractors that comes in and like yanks you all about and yanks you out of yourself and cracks you open. And that, I'm much more of Jorg's style. It's like, how much of a gentle approach that we can come in where we rest your nervous system into a sense where it can find and ease its way into alignment so that creative life force can come and fully emerge through you. And so that is the approach that we're working with in this class. We just took a class with Kate Singley. She's our guest teacher of this past 
uh, yesterday and this beautiful class on mindful erotic embodiment. This isn't about primal screams or getting naked or doing anything of that. She does this beautiful sensory awareness of just coming into relationship with your arrows. Can you feel it? Can you sense it? She gave us some daily practices. Our next teacher is going to be Langston Kahn, and he's talking about liberating the body's wisdom. So again, what are we doing? Well, we're coming into really getting into a practice of understanding how to work with our bodies as vessels. You know, when I went to school for the performing arts, it was, you know, it's like the, the triple threat. Can you dance? Can you sing? Can you act? You had to be in relationship with your body for the spirit to live through you. You know, the spirit of the story, the spirit of the act, the spirit of the dance. And so again, that's how we're entering into this is this embodiment place then we're coming into relationship with story sophie strand if she's not on your radar she should be she's such a hot ticket and she is um bringing us into a class of landscape as lover the deep ecology of deep healing so again we're looking at now relationship with self right now we're looking at relationship with land and and that intimacy that can be formed between us and how does our eros live through there why is this important the relationship to land is because you know uh Tyson was uh, the, the author of Sand Talk, was one of our guest teachers. Uh, he's from uh, an Aboriginal Australian, and he talks about no st all stories. A story is made of the land. You know, so to be in relationship with your stories, you've got to have connection with the land. It's a piece that's missing from so much of our weirdness right now. That's a great talk, by the way. And the one thing I'll tell you is that we do have an amazing master teacher library. So as soon as you join, for those of you who join the year long program, that's the first gift that you receive is access to over 40 hours of our guest master teachers. It is a treasure trove of learning. And that's the other thing that I found that people get out of this out of this program is just so much confidence to walk into the world as a storyteller, because they've gotten to sit with so many masterful people, and they've received so much practice and technique and guidance. Um, our next teacher is Ashara Akundeo, and she is from uh, the Bay Area. I love this woman. She's going to be teaching Imaginings Joy-Filled Movement Building. Okay, so now we're talking about how are we using our arrows in the world about things that we're passionate about. You know, she also created Arts as a First Responder, which I just loved. And then we're also going to be working with Dej, um, Dej um, Childcrit. And if you guys, oh my gosh, go on Instagram, go look up Morning Altars. Um, his work is beautiful, profound. And he'll be teaching us about courting with the muse, how to be in right relationship with your creative spirit. So those are the guest teachers that are supporting us. If you're getting a flavor of how much fun and delight we're going to be having all along the way, you're going to be working with me. So we meet on Tuesdays from 11 to 1 Pacific Standard Time. If you can't make a class, there's a recording. You can watch it that afternoon or evening. You've, you've got to be you get to be with your small group if you want to be with a group outside of class it's not a requirement but an offering um and you know in terms of who this class is for it's it's really just short if you want to be a conscious creator in our time which we've talked about earlier i'm not going to get into it um then our guest teachers are on thursdays so again this is part of the big program and you can jump in anytime i'm not going to go through all this because i feel like i just talked a lot for you guys and that's there you go and so you can just register from right here um, again, you can do payment plans, and when you um, do two classes at once, you get $50 off, so there's a little bit of an opportunity for you. So what you're seeing here is you can enter into the whole program, or you can just take the course that you are feeling passionate about and inspired by. I never talk this much during classes, it's much more about you guys, but if there are any questions right now, I'm happy to receive them. And um, otherwise, I'll leave you with a quote and we'll continue on our way. I do have a question, Leah. Yes. My question is, I came to this, um, to this um, class late and I'm wondering if I could see a replay. Yes, you absolutely can. Um, you are going to get an email probably in the next couple of hours and it will have a link to the replay. Um, what I'll tell you is that oftentimes those emails will end up in your promotion folders. And so um, you have to look, sometimes you got to look for them, but it will be there for you. Thank you. It was very interesting what I, what I witnessed. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, inquiries? The wild radical special offering that I've been making for people is that if you feel the spirit and you're just like all yes that uh, i throw in a bonus of um if you sign up for the whole program 
then I'm giving a I'm signing up for the whole program today. I'm, 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 what I'm doing is I'm giving a little fire, a little fire to tender with. Then I am offering a soul story session with me as a gift. And that is a one hour session that I do, um, which is about, it's a form of a storytelling divination. Never done this before, but I'll tell you, I've been so passionate about this program and so inspired by it that I was like, why not throw in a little extra gift just to make them know how wonderful the opportunity could be. Um, oh, thank you, Shana. Yeah, that was fun having you in 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 sanctuary, and in the, and and Shane is in our weekly story um, writing class, which is really fun. So I'm going to leave you with a quote. Um, my cousin Helen, who is in her 90s now, was in the Warsaw Ghetto during World War II, and she and a bunch of other girls in the ghetto had to do sewing every day, and if you were found with a book, it was an automatic death. She had gotten a hold of a copy of Gone with the Wind, and she would take three or four hours out of her sleeping time each night to read. And then during the hour or so when they were sewing the next day, she would tell them all the story. These girls were risking certain death for a story. And when she told me that story herself, it actually made what I do feel more important. Because giving people stories is not a luxury. It's actually one of the things that you live and die for. It's by Neil Gaiman. So may you carry your stories well. May you um, come alive in your passion and live with Eros. And if you have any questions, you can email away. And otherwise, I invite you to all take yourselves off mute. And we hope we can say farewell. Bye, thank you. Gracias. Bye, right, thank you, Leah. That was wonderful. Thank you, Leah. You're welcome. God bless y'all. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Mwah. Thank you. <laughs>